salt and light with Pastor Randy Mitchell. Jesus said to his disciples, Ye are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Salt and Light confronts the difficult and often controversial issues that affect today's culture. The only hope for this generation is for more people to follow Jesus Christ and for his followers to be salt and light in their community. Pastor Randy will discuss the Bible solutions to help us know what God says about the problems we face today. Salt and Light is a ministry of Temple Baptist Church in Statesville, North Carolina. Here's your host, Pastor Randy Mitchell. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Salt and Light Radio Broadcast. We are so glad that you have joined us today. We appreciate all of our listeners here in Statesville and all the way into Huntersville and this entire um, I-40, I-77 region. Uh, We also appreciate all of our listeners in the Asheville area on WKJV. Uh, We uh, show this broadcast uh, delayed on Saturday on uh, both of their stations, and uh, we sure appreciate you folks as well. And actually, we've got listeners all across this country through the Internet, and it seems like as time goes on, we keep picking up uh, a larger audience, and we're very thankful that uh, you tune in and listen to Salt and Light Radio broadcast. How often have we had situations in our past that at the time, they're extremely stressful, but uh, later on, years later, we look back on them and we just chuckle and we laugh because while it was stressful at the time, uh, it's pretty funny when we reflect. I had a situation prior to the 9-11 era. I went to, um, on a missions trip with my father-in-law, Brother Wendell Runyon, founder of IBOM, and he invited me to come along with him and uh, uh, about a dozen preachers, and we went and had a little bit of tourism in Israel, and then we drove across the border into Egypt. And um, while we were in Egypt, one of the preachers that was with the group was an Egyptian national, and he actually had connections with one of the senators of the country of Egypt. And so we got invited to come to his son's um, Muslim wedding. Now, I had never been to a Muslim wedding at that time. I didn't even know what to expect, but we went into this huge, huge banquet hall. I mean, high ceilings, everything was elaborate. There were just literally, it was probably well over a thousand people in attendance, and there's all kinds of festivities. They sat me and the other preachers all down in this big round banquet table, and we're kind of over in the corner. There's big screen, tel- uh, big screens televising the center stage all throughout this banquet hall. And so they've got all kinds of, um, um, things in their language that I didn't understand going on on center stage, part of the marriage ceremony and so forth. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, guess what comes out on the stage? A, belly dancer. (laughs) If if you can imagine this, here's a bunch of Baptist preachers, and we're looking at this, and all of a sudden, here is this uh, very, um, very immodestly dressed belly dancer. And so we all bow our heads. We're looking at the table. We're thinking, what do we do? We don't want to offend people around us because uh, we already kind of felt like we were a spectacle anyways. We don't want to offend them, but we don't want to be looking at that because we're Christians, we're preachers, we're trying to have a good testimony. And you talk about a stressful, awkward situation. Well, this senator comes over and he's talking to this uh, preacher who's an Egyptian national, and he's looking at all of us while this belly dancer's going on. I'm thinking in my mind, oh, great. You know, everywhere you look, there's a big screen that's showing this belly dance. Answer. And I'm thinking, my luck, I'll be on the other side of the world. This will be on CNN or something. And here, someone back home will see me as a preacher with this belly dancer in the background. I thought, oh, this is just great. So the senator uh, looks at this um, Egyptian national preacher and he says, he says, what, what's the matter? You, you, you men know like women? <laughs> So we're all like, how do you answer a question like that? And so um, the um, the Egyptian national was very diplomatic, and he just looked at him and and just kind of nodded matter-of-factly and said, 
we're priests. And when he said that, I'm like, I'm thinking, no, we're not. But when the senator is like, oh, okay, I understand. I thought, all right, I'm good with that answer. <laughs> we're, we're priests. If you say we're priests, then certainly we are priests. But uh, that's what I want to talk to you about today. I told that kind of uh, stressful but now funny story to just uh, draw attention to the word priest. Because today I want to talk to you about Christ, who according to the Bible is our high priest. Now, what exactly is a priest? I think that most people, sadly, don't really understand what a priest is. Most people, when you say the word priest, they think of some type of a minister with a backwards collar. They think of um, organized religion, so to speak. But to understand what a priest is, we've got to find that understanding from God's word, the Bible. And I want to read to you in Hebrews chapter number 2. And in verse number 17, this is speaking of Jesus Christ. It says, wherefore, in all things, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Now, I'm going to explain some of these, uh, some of this terminology and some of these phrases here in just a moment. But obviously, we can, as we read that text, we find that Jesus came down from heaven, God manifest in the flesh. He came down as a Jewish man so that he could be a merciful and a faithful high priest. There's all kinds of teaching, all kinds of inspirational information and what we just read from the Bible, but that is the general gist. Jesus came down as a Jewish man so that he could be a merciful and a faithful high priest. We do find in this passage of scripture a basic description. I I like the word description for this rather than definition because the term priest is one of those multifaceted words. It's really hard to give an overall definition with just one phrase or one synonym. But the basic definition of a priest, according to our text, is that a priest is a man who deals with things pertaining to God. Those three words, pertaining to God. The basic definition and function of a priest is a man, a human, who deals with things that are pertaining to God. I read in Exodus chapter number 19, verse 22, where the scripture says, let the priests also, which come near to the Lord, sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. So not only does a priest deal with things pertaining to God, but he's also one that the Lord says that that priest comes near to him. Now, I don't want to skip ahead to what I'm going to talk about later, but I think that it would be a good time to make sure that we all understand that since the cross of Calvary, our relationship with God, our potential relationship, that is, has been drastically changed. Prior to the cross and the resurrection, the only way that a man could get to God was through the Levitical priesthood, through that sacrifice that took place. Uh, There was a tabernacle, a huge tent that was set up that had all kinds of very religious furnishings. It had a table of showbread. It had an altar of incense and all these different things. But there was a big, huge curtain that separated the back portion of this tabernacle from the front portion. And that big, huge curtain is referred to as the veil. If you read in the New Testament that when Jesus was dying on the cross, when he said it is finished, the Bible says that miraculously, supernaturally, that the veil of the temple was rent in twain. It was torn in two from the top to the bottom, demonstrating that it was God who was tearing that curtain apart. And the reason that God did that is because he was signifying to mankind that the way to get to God is no longer through a human Levitical priesthood, but rather it is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus, as a priest, 
dealt with things pertaining to God, and he is also someone that comes near to God. Now, in verse number 18 of our text, it says, once again, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. This is a wonderful practical truth that is so often neglected by God's people. We find here that God tells us that Jesus Christ suffered temptation while he was on this earth. And if you've ever went through a temptation, and by the way, the temptation is more, temptation as a word means more than just simply an enticement to a, to sinful behavior. A temptation can also be a trial. It can be a struggle. It can be a test. Jesus Christ suffered being tempted. But you know what the wonderful thing about Jesus is that while he suffered through temptation, he overcame that temptation with perfect victory. And because he suffered and felt the same things that we feel, but overcame that temptation, rose above it, defeated the devil, defeated the temptation, we now have a high priest that we can go to Because of that, he is able to, the Bible says, to succor us. Now, that word succor in the Bible, in the King James Bible, it's spelled S-U-C-C-O-U-R. Now, it is obviously in uh, what we would call an antiquated, an archaic word. It's not a word that we commonly use today, at least not in the same way. We still use the word sucker. How many people have been suckered by a salesman to buy something that they shouldn't have bought? That that happens. And what most people don't realize is that while that is a that the definition and use of that word has kind of taken a rabbit trail, it's still the the same root word because that is that is a very very valuable word to know the meaning now let me pause call a time out and and kind of explain something here in modern christianity in the last say 50 75 years it has become overwhelmingly common to trade out these words for new english bible versions that are people say easier to understand and, you know, I, I think that we should understand the Bible, but there's also a danger in that because when we change words, we often change meanings. And if we don't totally change the meaning, we often rob ourselves of a rich understanding, a practical understanding that one word, while it may be archaic, While it might not be in common usage today, it is a rich word that has tons of meaning that would be valuable. I think there's so much hypocrisy in the pulpit today when people will say, I want to trade these words out for more modern English language. And then they start embellishing Greek words because that gives us a more rich meaning. They won't do the same thing with a word in our own language that we understand. And I I think that down deep, really, it's the preacher wanting to impress the congregation with his knowledge rather than to edify them with what the Bible is really saying. And so as I get back on track to our study, the word sucker simply means to, it means to draw unto Uh, Just like when I mentioned that a salesman will sucker you. What he did is he drew you into his, uh, into his scheme. He drew you in and thence we use the word, he suckered me. In the Bible, the word is more of a positive sense in that Jesus, because he has been tempted, he's able to draw us unto him. And the word also, because of its rich meaning, it also has to do with uh, with helping, with able to aid or assist. And so we've got a word that's so rich that says Jesus is able to draw us unto him and to aid us and assist us. Personally, I think that word ought to stay in there. I think, I believe that we ought to understand. I just explained what the word means and that wasn't that complicated at all. Uh, I find in Second Samuel chapter 21, that uh, Ishbinab, which was of the sons of the giant, 
the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword thought to have slain David. So here's this big giant with his sword drawn getting ready to kill King David. And it says, but Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, suckered him and smote the Philistine and killed him. What did he do? He drew that giant unto him and he aided and assisted David by killing the giant. David would have been dead if um, if Abishai had not suckered that giant to fight with him. And so it's a rich meaning that Jesus Christ is our high priest. And because of what he went through and because of the victory that he never did sin, even though he felt that temptation, because of that, he can understand us, but he can also aid us and assist us. Listen, if you are a born again Christian, a believer, we get tempted just like just like lost people. Everyone has the same human nature that we got from Adam. And so we are extremely susceptible. I wonder sometimes if God's people don't get tempted more because the devil wants nothing more than to take God's people down because that would dishonor Christ and it would honor him. And so just because you're saved doesn't mean that you that you won't face temptation. And we need to understand that God has given us a high priest that we can draw nigh unto him. The Bible makes it so clear that Jesus is there to help us in that time of need. And so often we think that the only way that we can overcome temptation is on our own, that we have to resist and have the willpower and be strong. But the best thing that we can do is acknowledge to God, God, I'm weak. I can't handle this on my own. And then go running to Jesus Christ and let him be the one to aid us and assist us. Now, the word priest appears over 800 times in the scripture. The overwhelming majority of these times, it's referring to the Levitical priesthood, the uh, the nation of Israel and the tribe of Levi. They were, they had the, the, office of the priesthood. Uh, Sometimes we find the word priest referring to a pagan priest, uh, such as in the days of the king and the the priests of Baal and different uh, pagan priests. But 31 times we find the word priest referring to none other than our Savior, Jesus Christ. And, you know, it's interesting, all of those 31 references we find in this particular book that I read from, the book of Hebrews. Now, the Levitical priest of the Old Testament had many responsibilities. The The biggest was the sacrifices that atoned for the sins of the people. Uh, one particular, many, many sacrifices, many details. God would spell out what kind of animal was to be slain, how it was supposed to be slain. Some of the offerings were burnt offerings, and uh, some of them he would the, the priest would have to do certain things with the blood of that slain animal in order to make that atonement for the sins of the people. But there was a particular day of atonement that took place on the same day every year. The Day of Atonement was on the 10th day of the 7th Hebrew month. The priest, the Levitical priest, had to do everything perfectly according to God's instructions. If he didn't, two things would happen. Number one, he would enter behind that veil, that curtain that I was talking about earlier, and the Bible says that God would strike him dead immediately. If he did not do things according to God's will. God was watching. God was present in that holy of holies, sitting on the mercy seat. God was there, and it was such a holy and reverent thing that if that priest did not do it the way God said to do it, he was he was a goner. He was toast. The second thing that would happen if the high priest did not do it the way he was supposed to do it is that the sins of the people would not be atoned for. Now, you'd say that seems like a very kind of nitpicky, just detailed, man, if they they messed up, there was serious consequences. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this demonstrates to us that not only the holiness of God, that God hates sin, but also that God is the supreme authority. 
And if we're going to get forgiveness from our judge and our creator, we've got to go about it his way. You can't just try to say, well, I'm going to do it my way and do the best that I can and expect God to accept it. Uh, Cain in the Old Testament tried to do the same thing, but God did not respect his offering. And so this Holy of Holies was a place where you had to go to get to God, to get atonement, to get salvation. There had to be a blood sacrifice and that lamb would be slain and then the priest would bring that blood and present it at the mercy seat in that Holy of Holies. Now, the Bible says that the priesthood of Jesus is far superior to that Old Testament Levitical priesthood and sacrifice. Hebrews 7 verse 22 says, by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. That's why we have an Old Testament and a New Testament. The, the word testament always is related to death and blood. Uh, people talk about their last will and testament. They do that uh, after, because of their death or their impending death. And so a testament in the Old Testament was referring to animal sacrifices, but in the New Testament, it's a better testament because it's by the blood of Jesus Christ. And the book of Hebrews goes on to talk about how that the Levitical uh, Old Testament priest did not live forever. And so you'd have a good priest and the next one might be a bad priest. And the Bible chronicles a number of high priests that were not righteous men. And because of their wickedness, the, the entire nation suffered. But folks, we have a high priest that is perfect and he is eternal. The Bible says that when he rose from the dead the third day, after he ascended up into heaven, the Bible says he's sitting at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. What a comforting truth to know that our Savior, who understands us, lived as a man, did not sin. He was not only the high priest. This is just, just amazes me, folks. Not only was he the priest presenting the sacrifice, but he was the sacrifice himself. He was the lamb. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, he said, Behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus was the sacrificial lamb and the high priest that presented his own blood to God the Father in the third heaven, in the holy heaven where God sits on his throne. And it is only by that blood that the human race can be, our sins can be atoned for. And so as a summary of Christ's priesthood, as we are about out of time, first of all, he reconciles the sinner to God. He does that by his sacrifice. He also does that by his eternal intercession. Listen, he understands and he's making intercession. He's talking to a holy God on our behalf. The Bible refers to him as our propitiation as our advocate. He's the one that's on our side. The devil is our adversary, but Jesus Christ is our ad advocate. And so he's making intercession for us. And then not only that, but he is there to help us in our time of need. Hebrews 4 verse 15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. Jesus, our great high priest. It's a practical teaching. We need to take advantage of our wonderful high priest. God bless you. Hope you have a good day. We appreciate you taking the time to join us at Salt and Light. It is our desire that you experience the joy of following Jesus Christ. He loves you, and He died on the cross for your sins. He will give you hope, peace, and eternal life if you will repent of your sins and trust Him as your Savior. You may see yourself as a good person, but you will never be good enough to deserve heaven. You may see yourself as bad, but you can never be too bad for Jesus to forgive you. You can call upon Him to save you this very moment. If you are a born-again Christian, we want to encourage you to obey Christ's command and be salt and light to those around you. 
We encourage you to find a Bible-believing church that does not compromise or water down the Bible. Get involved serving the Lord. If you have a Bible question or a particular issue you would like us to discuss on Salt and Light, visit our website at templebaptistnc.com. Click on the Salt and Light link. Once again, that's templebaptistnc.com. May the Lord bless you. We hope you'll join us again next week.